I want to thank everybody for coming out to tonight. It's a rainy, dirty evening. Um, I saw a, 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 an image on Twitter saying that the child of Prague is going on strike at the moment and because the weather is so poor. But um, I do want to thank you uh, for coming here tonight. The second thing I want to thank is the Aim to Cabin Commons that are operating uh, in Cabin. There's two Commons currently in Cabin. These are people, most of them who were never involved in politics ever before. And they are working together and they're building an organization from scratch without any experience in the past. And I think that's a tremendous achievement for people to be able to do that. And because most organizations have decades of experience and people to show and direct and, and, and educate how to build an organization. And here are people brand new to the political system and who are involved in, in that. So I want to thank you for all your work and putting to, uh, tonight together as well. I'm delighted to be sharing the platform uh, with Councillor Sarah O'Reilly, uh, with Brody McPhillips and Tinko Sinev tonight. I'm absolutely delighted because these are people of serious high quality. This is absolutely the case. First of all, I want to say that you know we have Ireland's hardest working councillor here in Councillor Sarah O'Reilly. And I, 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 I don't say that easily. It is absolutely factual that she never stops. She absolutely never stops for her community. Um, and that was shown and reciprocated in the last local election when Sarah topped the poll uh, in that election. And it's absolutely <laughs> I honestly believe that Sarah will be Cabin's hardest working TD in the future as well. Uh, and I do believe that the growth that we're experiencing across the country, and especially in the Cabin Monum area at the moment, gives Sarah a significant chance of taking a seat uh, in the next election. Uh, it is probably down to us as an organization to get behind her uh, and to make sure that happens uh, in the next while. I'm delighted to be here with, obviously, Grani. Grani is a very well-educated professional woman. And you know when she said that she was 29 now, I just remembered that she got a phenomenal council result when she was only 24 years old uh, in the elections uh, last time, which is an incredible result. Uh, the, the vote she got saw many councillors elected in other local authorities uh, across the country. Uh, it was an incredible vote. There's not much further that she has to push, but we hope that the activists here in Cavan will put in that little bit of extra work uh, over the next, what is it, six and a half, seven weeks at this stage to get her across the line. And it will be a terrific addition uh, if we had a councillor also in, in the Valley Dame stuff area. I'm also delighted to have Tinko Tinev uh, here as well. Tinko is a member of our organization for the last four years. He's a man of very strong conviction. He has a moral compass, which is really important uh, in the political stream uh, here in this country. Many simply don't have it at all. He's an incredibly hard worker too, a community activist, uh, who's involved in giving a leg up to many people who, uh, like himself, have come new uh, into the cabin community. And I think that's a sign of decency as well. And I'd like to thank him uh, for that too. And I think he will be a terrific addition. Imagine if we got three out of three in the cabin local elections. Imagine the, the message that would send yeah. to the political system in this county. It would put the government on notice that AIM2 is a serious threat to, to their political establishment and their manner of operating uh, in the future as well. We can actually get these three people elected. It is in our grasp. It is an opportunity that we must uh, push home uh, in the next local election. I'm going to touch on a couple of issues that some of the other speakers stole off me before uh, I got a chance to speak at all. The next time I'm in cabin, I'm speaking first, okay, and uh, not at the end. But um, I just want to speak first of all to what Sarah mentioned around the hospital service. And that's around an issue that nobody else is talking about. And what I mean by that is accountability. Accountability is one of the big challenges that we have in the political system here at council level and in the Dáil as well. That's a, 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 it's a serious issue and I, I'll go down and I'll give you the reasons why I think that is the case. So Sarah mentioned that a half a million people have been injured by the health service over the last five years. 
they call it adverse incidents. It sounds less difficult when you have an adverse incident rather than you've been actually injured. 3,150 of those people killed by an accident in a hospital. That is horrendous that it's happening today. And it's happening today because in many wards across uh, Ireland's health service, nurses are bursting themselves because there are very few of them on the ward. There's not enough doctors and nurses within the hospitals to be able to do the job. And actually, uh, Simon Harris, the new teacher, when he was Minister for Health, carried out a report at a cost of 1.2 million euros, which found, and its conclusions were, that there weren't enough staff in Irish hospitals and it was leading to a lot of people getting injured. Now, anybody here could have written exactly the same report in five minutes for, for a fire. But that's actually what's happening at the moment. And if you look at the number of doctors that qualified last year, over 700, the number of doctors that went to Australia and Canada, 440 last year. An incredible figure. And as a result, we have to backfill in those places with doctors from other parts of the world. And the same is happening amongst nurses. Simply because we live in a planet now where the medical profession is an international recruitment market. So if you want to employ people, you have to make sure that you have the, the best terms and conditions and wages to give to them. Otherwise, they will vote with their feet and they will go. But the government is simply refusing to do that with our doctors and nurses and leaving the few remaining staff there under so much pressure that we see this level of damage happening. And incidentally, it was, it was aimed to parliamentary questions that found out all of that information. It was also aimed to parliamentary questions that found out that the state has paid 1.5 billion euros in the space of the last three years in compensation to the people that they have damaged. Imagine if the state actually invested that 1.5 billion euros just in the health service and paid those staff properly, the transformative effect that that would have in the health service. And all of this actually is circular. Because when we see the lack of doctors, we know that people in Calvin, for example, have difficulty in getting a doctor. A lot of people can't get on a doctor's list. If you're on a doctor list, you can actually get a uh, 10 days for your next appointment. So for people who are looking for an appointment or can't get on the list, what they do is they go to the a and &E. The a and &E is their only option. And as a result, the a and &E are stuffed currently with people. And because the a and &E are stuffed with people, we have a situation whereby we have ambulances now that are arriving to hospital a &E's, trying to deliver their patients but because there's no rooms in the A&Es, it's taking forever to get those patients into the A&Es. And an a &E, or a, 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 an A2 parliamentary question has found out that in 2016, 650 people were dead by the time an ambulance actually arrived to them. An incredible figure. Last year, it was 1,180 people dead by the time an ambulance actually arrived. Every year, it's the fatalities before an ambulance arrives is actually getting worse. And the reason being is because by the time the ambulance arrives in the hospital, they can't deliver their patient. In Drogheda, you had a situation there a little while ago where 11 ambulances were stuck for five hours outside of Drogheda Hospital, unable to deliver their patients. And in the whole of Cam, Monaghan, Mead and Louth, there was no ambulances available at all. An incredible situation. And I'll give you an example, just one example. A woman actually uh, who hails from this part of the country but has been living in me for the last uh, 40 years. A friend of mine, she's, she lives about five minutes away from Navin Hospital. She took a stroke at the age of 66 um, and she was, she had just retired. She worked in gun stores all her life. Um, you would imagine that an, a, a, an ambulance would get to her in speedy time. It took an hour and a half for that ambulance to get to her. And as you know with a stroke, you need to have fast treatment to be able to fight against it. So she's brought her to the hospital and she's started to work and treat her and help her. Within a week, she was getting a shower uh, in a shower unit. Two nurses brought her to the shower. One nurse was pulled away because of the busyness of the hospital. She slipped and fell and she hit her head against the floor of the shower and she took a serious head injury. And as a result, she was moved to Beaumont. And in Beaumont, because she had a name that was similar, to somebody else's name, she got the wrong blood transfusion. And as a result, she has serious internal organ damage. And actually, a relation of hers that I, I realize is actually sitting in the second row here as well uh, tonight. 
Now, there was a woman who spent all her life working in this country. She paid all her taxes in this country. She did everything right. She just got to 66. She should be looking at 20 good years of mobility and, and joy and happiness and, and fruitfulness with her grandchildren. And here she spent the last uh, probably 10 years now completely immobile because of, of, of that experience. And that is happening right through our health service because of the fact that this government won't recruit and resource the health system that we have. And actually the government's going backwards. They closed Monaghan, they put further pressure on Calvin. They closed the dock, they put further pressure on uh, Drogheda. And now they're looking to close Naman Hospital, which I tell you will fill your wards even further here in Calvin in the near future. Now, I had the Secretary General of the Department of Health, the most senior civil servant in the Department of Health, in with me in uh, the Finance Committee there about uh, six months ago, and I asked him, in his full experience of being a senior civil servant, did he know of anybody who lost their job because of one of these mistakes, or who has moved sideways for one of these mistakes, or had a pay cut for one of these mistakes? And he said, no. It has never been my experience that anybody has actually had a cost to them at all for the actions that went wrong in the health service in his time. Now I'll tell you what, if there's no cost to a person for not doing their job or for damaging somebody else, you can bet your bottom dollar there will never be any change. We will be talking about these issues over and over and over again unless there's, there's change, unless there's accountability. So Leo Varadkar promised that the National Children's Hospital will be built by 2020 at a cost of 700 million euros, save that an asteroid would hit the planet. Here we are in 2024, at a price of 2.25 billion euros. We still don't have a close our finished date, and we still don't have a finished price. Now, if that happened in any private sector operation, Leo Varadkar would have been fired years ago. And yet, nobody is holding Leo Varadkar or anybody involved in the, that project to account at all. I know of a particular room that was redesigned, re, the, the design was, was redrafted 120 times in the National Children's Hospital. Every time it was drafted, somebody else had to change it and it cost more money to deal with it. No, no, absolutely nobody else to account for that at all. 118 electric buses were bought by Bus Aaron. Somebody forgot to put the planning application in for the electric charger. The buses have sat in Dublin for two years in mobile losing value. Nobody ever held to account whatsoever. 22 million euros of ventilators that didn't work were bought by this government during COVID. Nobody held to account. Today, they're actually being stored at a cost of 50,000 euros a year, and nobody's held to account. An incredible situation. Unless we actually get to a situation where there's accountability in this country for the actions of people Nothing is going to change. It is our objective, at council level, at every level, to inject accountability into the system. I know, for example, in Middleton and Cork, we have a, a, a massive flood in 2015. The government promised that they would build the flood defences there. Nothing happened since then. There's not even a planning application uh, in that period of time. There's an old man who gets up in the lashings of rain now in Middleton. He is a human water gauge. His job is to find out at night time, is the water coming up so much that people's lives are in danger? And yet the governments are motionless in relation to that. We have Metro North in Dublin, 300 million euros and not a shovel put in the ground yet. The, the Navin to Dublin Rail Line, which one day we would like to see uh, extend to Cavan to make sure that people can actually get to work in time. No movement in that either. That was built in three years of picks and shovels. The government will be talking about it for 20 years now at this stage, and uh, no movement. So you can take it from us. That is our objective to, to put accountability into the system. The other issue that I want to talk about briefly is the political bubble. And again, I think uh, Sarah uh, touched on this a little bit earlier. And the referendum, I think, is an example <laughs> of the political bubble. So the referendums were, like, I think they, they show the, the structure of groupthink in this state. So what happened? Okay, so the governments are talking to themselves, they're not listening to the people. And the government create this particular referendum, which does a number of things. One, it deletes the word mother from the constitution, which is an incredible situation. Um, it, it also talks about the idea that um, carers 
uh, will get support, but it provides absolutely no constitutional powers for them to get support, and it actually deletes uh, a constitutional guarantee of support. And they push this particular agenda because they think that it makes them look good. It's kind of like a virtue signaling, flag waving exercise. They put out a warning to the NGOs, if you don't support this, you better be, be very careful. The NGOs are, de are dependent on the government for their funding. So most of those NGOs, actually the majority of their funding comes from the government. A an incredible situation. And you know, my grandfather used to say, if you want to know what a person thinks, just find out who pays their wages. And in many cases, that's what happened with the NGOs. Um, the NGOs fell in line with the government. I asked Sinn Féin and the Labour Party, some of the members, why did they not refuse uh, the referendums? And they said to me they didn't want to go against the NGOs. So you have this circular conversation happening in the elite, the metropolitan elite in Dublin, around what should be happening to this country. But that's not the way politics should work. These individuals are actually employed by your taxpayers' money to implement your will in the dole. And yet none of these people are actually listening to you, they're listening to themselves. An incredible situation in this country. What we did mean to, first of all, our movement was built to be able to stand up for what we believed in. And when we saw the amendments in the referendums, we said, okay, we'll critically analyze these, analyze where they're going. And when we did, we found out that they were damaging. Now, I'll be honest, we braced ourselves, we said, you know, the, the same old, same old people are going to come after us, they're going to attack us, they're going to try and pigeonhole us on these issues. But we said, what's the point of actually being a political activist if you're not actually going to stand up for what you believe in? So we stood by it, we made the case around it, we were the only political party to do so. And thank God, I think we have reached a watershed in Irish politics at the moment. I think that, you know, you can see all of the political parties U-turning in a dizzying fashion at the moment, recalibrating their messages, reorientating. It's incredible to see. And again, in another example, it was mentioned in the hate speech bill. Now, first of all, I want to say, we abhor hate speech, okay? We do not support the idea that people are hateful to each other. We want people to respectfully engage with each other. But at the heart of a democracy is the idea that ideas compete with each other. And when they compete with each other, the best ideas percolate to the top, and then people can see what those ideas are, and that's how progress happens. But if you have a system where the government starts to put a chilling effect on debate, it actually makes people afraid to speak their views respectfully. But that's very dangerous, because you don't have that competition of ideas, you have a significant swing in ideology, and the country can go down crazy directions in, in relation to that. And that's what was at the heart of the hate speech bill. They couldn't define what the word hate is. And let me tell you, if I'm gonna put you in jail for five years, you should know why I'm putting you in jail for five years. It should, you should have to guess <coughs> excuse me, why a person would put you in jail. And yet the government wouldn't, wouldn't uh, define that. And secondly, they wouldn't define what the word gender meant either. And this is incredible because we're living at a time where the government are putting male-born sex offenders into women's prisons, which is an incredible thing. Ainsley was the only party that created the bill to stop that. Now, the majority of people actually believe what we believe. We believe in science. We believe in evidence. We do believe that there are people with gender dysphoria who have very difficult uh, times that need support, and those people should have support based on science and evidence. But well, we also believe that a woman is a female adult, and it shouldn't be a crime to say so. And that's really, really important in today's society. <laughs> I, was when I was in that debate, uh, some of my older, my old colleagues from my former party were to the left of me in the chamber, and you know they were all welcoming the hate speech bill with open arms, and they were so enthusiastic for it. And I was scratching my head because. When I was a member of that organization, there was a thing called Section 31, and Section 31 was a form of censorship. And what it did was it stopped elected representatives being able to speak on the television. And I knew that was wrong at the time, and my former colleagues knew that was wrong at the time, and here they were flipping a direction, and actually agreeing to censorship, agreeing to the ability for people to be able to, be, to shut up. So it is very, very important to us that you have a party that will actually stand up for what we believe. Another issue that we stood up for 
was the climate change bill. And again, we understand that there is climate change, and we understand that it is caused man-made CO2, okay? But we also understand that it needs to be fixed in a realistic, reasonable fashion that doesn't impoverish farmers and families. And in that climate change bill, it had a built-in carbon tax increase for the next seven years. Now, any government that would increase a carbon tax on a society without even knowing what economic circumstances they're going to be in is a bad government. And actually, we turned out to be correct. We were the only party to vote against it. And what about a year after we voted against it, we had the cost of living crisis happen, where exponentially prices of fuel and energy went through the roof. And yet, the government still put on those carbon taxes. An A2 parliamentary question last, year, uh, last month showed that the government took 3.5 billion euros in fuel taxes last year, the highest figure in a decade. An incredible situation. And it, it's incredible because this was in the jaws of a cost of living crisis. So the government were giving you tea and sympathy with one hand, and they were pilfering your pocket with the other hand, taking more taxes out of your pockets. And we had that increase recently. We had the increase in the tolls recently. We're going to have another increase uh, in uh, excise duty in August as well from the Green Party. And the Green Party, again, another party in a political bubble divorced from the realities of people's lives. So the Greens are saying that they're, they're jacking up these prices to get people to change their behaviors. Okay, I, I would be happy in some occasions to see people change their behaviors. I would love to see people be able to use public transport far better, but there isn't enough public transport. I would love to, pe to see people have alternatives to heat in their homes, but for many there isn't. I would love to see many people have proper deep retrofitting of their homes so their homes are, water are, are, are airtight, but that is not the opportunity for people. So the Greens are bringing in a stick to change people's behaviours who can't change people, who can't uh, change behaviours. So that means that's not enough, there's no alternatives for them, so those tax increases are actually just punitive. They're hurting families instead. So again, we in A2 have been the only political party that's been pushing against that agenda for the last while. And you know, I, I just think it's, it's incredible that we have a government part, we have government parties, we have establishment parties, and then we have an opposition. A2 is the only real opposition politically that exists in this country. We're the only organized opposition to what's happening uh, in government circles uh, at the moment. And the reason we can do that is because we listen to our members, we listen to the people on the ground, and we have the backbone to be able to stand up for what we believe in uh, as well. Just in relation to the housing, this is another example of what's, what's wrong with the system. A an ancient parliamentary question found out that there are 3,500 houses currently, local authority houses that are empty. Okay, that's enough houses to accommodate everybody who is in emergency accommodation. It's about 14,000 people in emergency accommodation at the moment. Now, it's taken eight months to flip those houses around to make them accessible to a new family. But in the private sector, if you have a rental property and you need to turn it around, on average, it takes three weeks to turn that around. Why should it take the state eight months to turn it around when it takes the private sector three months? The reason is because the private sector, somebody's paying a mortgage on that house and they cannot afford it to leave it uh, vacant or idle for that length of time. So again, we want these councillors to be able to hold the local authorities to account to make sure that we get uh, back into uh, those homes as well. We have, the government are providing currently a grant to help people get empty houses back into use. Okay, now the grant is so stringent that they pr you practically have to be homeless and have a home at the same time to nearly apply for one of these grants. The government managed three of these grants on a monthly basis since about last July, which is, means that the problem will be solved in 3,100 years at this particular rate of, of travel, which is an incredible situation. The government have also rolled out the red carpets to the vulture funds. We have vulture funds in this country who have massive access to capital internationally and really low uh, capital costs, and who are paying no taxes for the work that they do here at the moment. And they're competing with young couples who actually have very little access to capital, very high interest rates, and are paying top of the range uh, taxes. The government have stacked the housing system 
against young couples who are looking to buy houses. We in AT have produced a bill that would actually force REITs and international uh, budget funds to pay taxes like everybody else. And that should be the way that it happens uh, in this country in, in the future. I want to talk about an issue of immigration uh, at the moment. The issue of immigration is, is a big issue uh, at the doors. It's also a very sensitive issue. And I will say we in A2 believes from the start that it's important to have this conversation. Because if the conversation wasn't had, the conversation will be pushed underground. It will be manipulated by ne'er do wells for their own negative purposes. Now, the first thing I will say is that we are a Republican political party. We believe that everybody is equal. And the color of a person's skin is of no more significance than the color of their eyes. And we, as a party, have members from all different backgrounds, and they are welcome and valued in our organization. And I will say this too. We have seen how the government have handled this crisis, and they are making a disaster out of it. And that is the truth of it. A disaster is happening. Currently, um, the, 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 and most of this information that is in the public domain is information that we have gleaned. So we put in a parliamentary question, and we found out that 85% of the deportation orders that the government have issued in the last five years, 5,000 deportation orders, have never been actioned, okay? So I asked the Minister of Justice, Helen McAtee, a woman from my own county, and says, where are these people, Helen? And she said, I don't know where they are. And I said, well then, is this not a voluntary deportation system that you've organized? And she wouldn't answer that question. But when you think about it, we are spending hundreds of millions of euros to differentiate between those who need help and those who don't need help. And at the end of the system, the outcome for both sides is exactly the same, which is an incredible situation. We've also found out that 5,000 people came through Dublin Airport last year without um, their travel documents, which is an incredible situation. We need to make sure that people come to Ireland, especially from other European countries, with their travel documents. We also found out that 75% of the people who are now applying for asylum for Ireland, the government is not asking them how they come into the country which is an incredible thing. So that is a dangerous thing because we know that some people are being trafficked, some people are being smuggled. There was a case in uh, Rosslair very recently where a family of 14 were in a refrigerated uh, um, container and they had to phone people themselves to let uh, the authorities know where they were because it was a danger of these people dying. The state would not have known uh, what was happening to those people uh, until it was too late. An incredible situation. Ireland is on a tier two watch list currently by the US State Department in terms of being a dangerous place for trafficking in Ireland. Ireland has brought a thousand court cases for trafficking in the last 10 years. If anybody can guess how many convictions there are, I'll give them a 10. There were three convictions in a thousand cases over the last 10 years. I've never seen such a failure in conviction rates in terms of trafficking. So the government don't know how many people are being smuggled, they don't know how many people are being trafficked, and they don't know how many people are coming over from uh, over the border and then from the north of Ireland. And if you can't manage, you can't, you can't, if, sorry, if you can't measure, you can't manage. And just, it reminds me of another point that I want to mention that again, it means you have been before on. Roderick McCormick, and I don't know where to start with Roderick McCormick, to be honest, but we are working on, on, on this issue. It's a very, very important issue at the moment. Right now, there's about 90,000 children who are being referred to Tusla on an annual basis, okay? It is a heartbreaking figure. It is 35,000 more than actually sat leaving cert last year. So every year now, there's 90,000 who are um, being uh, referred to Tusla. And that's up about 40,000 just in the space of five years. And again, actually, that goes back in many ways to COVID because obviously the lockdown has really made it difficult for young people, especially in vulnerable situations during COVID. And again, no shock, AIM2 is the only political party actually pushing back against the government in terms of the, the severity and the length of those uh, lockdowns that happened in Ireland. But what's happening to the children is incredible. The governments are putting children into unregulated, what they call special emergency accommodation units. Now, that is an incredible situation. These are the most vulnerable children some of them fleeing horrendous situations. And the government is putting, putting them not into a sanctuary, but into an unregulated area. In some cases, those children don't have staff who are vetted. 
which is an incredible situation. So UCT have done a study and they have shown that there are gangs now who are preying on these children who, in relation to trying to exploit them in some situations uh, for sexual exploitation. These are people, the, the government is in locus parentis for these children. They are, in, they are acting as the parent of these children and they're not even minding those children properly. And those children are going missing on a monthly basis in their dozens. There was an article in the Examiner that showed 22 children went missing in January from these locations. And a, a very, very sad uh, situation. So in relation to, to the immigration system, what we want is a system that is compassionate, but also a system that has common sense, okay? So right now we want a system that differentiates very efficiently and fast those who need help and those who don't. We want to make sure that the government engages with communities. Communities have a right of consent to what happens in their area. There must be investment in those communities. And there's no investment happening in terms of housing, health and education, and teachers and, and, and doctors in those communities. There has to be change in relation to that. And incredibly, the government is starting to move slowly, but now their new plan is to sign up to the EU Migration Pact, which would cede sovereignty to the European Union on these issues. And we know from the banking crisis that Europe does not make decisions all the time for Ireland's best interests. We need sovereignty over these issues. We need to be able to make decisions uh, in relation to these. So there's just a, a quick run through of a lot of the issues that we're discussing at, in the Dáil at the moment, in the Council at the moment. Incredibly, into is, I would believe, is punching well above our weight currently. And it's incredible, if you look at the polls, it's quite interesting. Into is at 5% in the latest poll, one in the journal just about a couple of days ago and the other in the business post uh, about a week and a half ago. There are three parties underneath us, Labour Party, the Green Party and people before profits. They have between them 154 elected reps. We have four elected reps. They have between them millions of euros of state funding. We have zero state funding. They have like hours and hours of broadcast media time we get little bits and pieces here and there. What is the difference between those four political parties? One, we have a backbone and we will stand up for what we believe. That is the significant difference between us and the other so-called opposition parties, and that is the engine of our growth at the moment. The other engine of our growth is the fact that we have a membership base. This is really critical. Some people don't think Cummins are important. I'll tell you why Cummins are important. The big political parties their grassroots are dying on a daily basis. I'm talking to Fianna Fáil TDs and they're telling me some of their, in some counties, their comments don't even meet. If you don't know what's happening on the ground, you become detached from the reality of people's lives. And comments meeting on a monthly basis are really important sources of information. But they're also the grassroots people who work in their local communities and who bring aim to life through their campaigning in those lo local communities. People get to know their local comments, get to like the party, and get to trust the party as well. We've reached 2,000 members in our final organization, which is an incredible figure. Mm -hmm. And puts us probably roughly at the same size membership-wise now as the Labour Party and the, the Sock Dems currently as well. And that membership is growing uh, year in, year out. One of the big questions I would ask for people who are not already members of our final organization here tonight is, I would ask you to consider becoming a political activist. And, and that's really, really important. I might have mentioned this to you before, but Homer Simpson once ran for mayor in The Simpsons. And in that show, he had a motto. And his motto was, why can't somebody else do it, okay? <laughs> now, if that's your motto, you can bet your bottom dollar that nothing is ever gonna get done. The people on this top table are no more responsible for what happens in this republic than anybody else on the floor here. No more responsible. We are all just citizens in this republic. And that's why a participatory republic is the only remedy to the disaster that's happening in the political establishments at the moment. And that's why I would really encourage people. We have an Ordesh that's happening on the 27th, it's only two weeks away, uh, in Minus, the Glen Royal Hotel in Minus, uh, in County Kildare, where we will have at least 400 into delegates from across the country to gather. Our policy is democratically made at those Ordeshina, 
uh, by the membership and our elected representatives have to follow uh, that policy. Our membership are the leadership of our party. No other political party uh, does that currently. Because my attitude is if you're going to ask a person to leaflet or poster or canvas, you have a responsibility then to listen to them in terms of the direction of your organisation as well. So I would say to people, don't leave here tonight without signing their name up in terms of membership and activism. Get involved in the pushback. Our country is too important to leave it to the political bubble. If you get involved with us, if you help these people canvass and leave it, and this is important too because, you know, people say to me, oh, I've never canvassed before, but I don't know if I'd be cut out for it. Uh, and I'll tell you, canvassing is simply a chat. It's where people stand in front of, of like-minded citizens and they reach out to them and say, listen, Tinko is a good guy. He's a guy with good moral fibre. He's a hard worker. He's a man of his community. Will you give him a number one vote? Or if you say, Sarah O'Reilly Sarah has done more for this community than practically any other local representative, make sure now you give him the vote. And those types of conversations, letting them know about the qualities of Ron and McPhillips, simple chats make an awful difference. And the more people you out, you cover more ground, you, make, you reach more people. So it appeals to you to get involved over the next while. One thing that I'll leave you with is this. People forget the power that they have. They really do. You have power. In a democracy, the power is yours. You only lose it when you cede it to politicians. Take it back. The only way to take it back is to get active. Make sure that the elections on the, 20, on the 7th of June are elections of change. And the final point, I'll be standing for the elections, obviously, in the Midlands Northwest constituency. People have asked me, does that mean that you're lost to me over the next while? The truth of the matter is, the strategy is, that I'm standing in that election to crowbar our objectives into the political debates in that, refer in, in, in that election. If Angel is not at the table, the political establishment will talk about their role. If they too is, is at the table in that debate, we will make sure that cost of living, crime and anti-social behaviour, farming, all of these issues are in the centre of that debate. But I, I am saying up front that if win or lose the next general uh, election in the South, I will be standing uh, in that general election in the West. And um, all parties have done this before. The only difference is we and Angel are being upfront about it. I'm delighted to say that we have a list of substitutes that would take my seats potentially in Europe if I am uh, re-elected to the Dáil. One of those substitutes, I say, uh, and uh, is a super sub, and that's Gráinne McPhillips. Uh, her name is on that list. So if it comes to the case where I win a European seat for uh, AIM2 and the Dáil seats for AIM2 and Meath West, there's a significant chance that one of your own could be representing yourselves in Brussels in the future, and I think that will be a big plus for Calvin and an extra reason for people to get involved in this campaign. Garmila Mahal, good for